morning subscribers. Today I'm bringing you a video with regard to the demand for money. This is something that we've been looking at when we have been considering the transmission mechanism and we haven't really to this point said much about why the money demand curve slopes downwards from left to right. So this morning I'm just going to put all of that into place for you. So I'm sure you'll be aware from your studies of A2 that there are three reasons why people hold money. Number one, the transactions demand for money. People hold money for their everyday transactions and they hold probably about the same amount every day in their back pocket for those everyday things like bus journeys, taxi fares, newspapers, milk, bread, that type of thing. So that's the transactions demand for money. In addition, should people find that they get, for example, you may find you get to school and the bus home is breaks down for some reason and there's a little emergency there, so you might have a little bit of extra cash just stashed away safely so that you can obviously get a taxi or something like that. So that would be the precautionary demand. That's for those uh, out of normal expenses that you might incur. And then we have thirdly, the speculative demand. Now the speculative demand for money is the, the, uh, the demand that I really want you to focus on today because this really determines the reason why the money demand curve slopes downwards from left to right. So speculative, you'll have come across this term of course before with regard to speculators when we're considering for example the exchange rate and these people trying to make money uh, from appreciations and depreciations in a currency. Well the same thing can be applied in a way to the money demand curve, the money demand schedule, but this time we're talking about bond prices rather than currency movements. So what are bonds? Bonds are of course a, a means by which the government can finance its borrowing and they tend to issue these bonds in maybe 10 or 15 year tranches. And here in this example, we're going to look at the relationship between the bond price, the coupon payment, which is the interest rate payment that you would get on an annual basis. And in this instance, we're assuming that it's a fixed rate interest bond and then the yield on the bond, so the actual return as in the interest rate. So, to take you through this very simple example, which we can then apply to our money demand curve, if the bond price is £10 and you receive a coupon payment or a, uh, an annual return on that of £10, then obviously your rate of return, your yield on that is 10%. If the bond price rises, so if you think about what's been happening with QE all around the world um, as central banks have been buying bonds left, right and centre, the demand for them is going up and as with anything, that as the demand rises, the price goes up. So bond prices rise to £200. Remember we're talking about a fixed rate bond here, so the yield, uh, the coupon payment rather is still £10, but obviously £10 as a percentage of 200 that is then 5% rather than 10%. And so we've established here the relationship between the price of the bond and the yield on the bond. So we can see that as the bond price rises, the yield... Sorry, got that arrow the wrong way around. As the bond price rises, the yield is falling. So how do we then apply this to our money demand curve. Why is it that it slopes downwards from left to right like this? Well, we're assuming uh, two things. We're assuming one thing here, really. We're assuming that individuals um, and economic agents are either holding cash or bonds. That's the option. You know? If you're not holding cash, you're holding bonds. If you're not holding bonds, you're holding cash. So take this point on the money demand curve, point A. You can see we've got a very significant interest rate but the quantity of money demanded here is relatively low. So the amount of cash that people are holding, cash balances in their back pocket, is low. Now, why would that be the case? Well, obviously, in this model, we're assuming that people, if they're not holding lots of cash, they must be holding lots of bonds. So why would they be holding lots of bonds when we're at point A, when the interest rate is way up here at RA? Well, think back to our relationship that we've got in this table. 
When the interest rate is very high, the next predictable movement will probably be in a downwards direction. Now, if the downwards direction of the interest rate does actually arise, so we move from 10% yield to 5% yield, look what happens to the bond price. The bond price goes up. And so speculators would be anticipating a movement downwards in the interest rate, thus pushing up the price of the bond, therefore making it more valuable to hold bonds rather than cash. Consider the alternative, point B. So here we're saying that individuals are holding lots of cash balances and not so many bonds. Why? Well, when the interest rate is low, what's the next predictable maybe rise in the interest rate? Upwards. When the interest rate goes upwards on the bond, what happens to the price of the bond? The price of the bond falls and therefore it makes less sense to hold lots of bonds if it were the case that it was going to reduce and lower the value of that bond. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is why the money demand curve slopes downwards from left to right. Bye for now.